Hi, my name is Ethan DeVries, and I'm a senior studying international relations at Calvin College. I would also like to welcome you to the January series 2017. I would also like to extend a special welcome today to the guests at three of the 50 remote webcast sites, Wyckoff, New Jersey, Stillwater, Oklahoma, and St. Joseph, Michigan. And now, if you will please pray with me. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you today for bringing us together to listen and learn about the world around us. We are grateful for the opportunity to learn and engage your world through the January series. We give thanks for your faithfulness to Kelvin, and we pray that you will continue to bless the work of the administration, faculty, staff, and students. Thank you for bringing Todd Heisinger here today to speak to us. We commit this program into your hands. Amen. And now Ken Erfmeyer, the Vice President for Advancement, will introduce our guest. Todd Heisinger worked as a United States diplomat from 1992 to 2012. He served in Luxembourg, Belgium, Germany, Mexico, Ireland, and Costa Rica. This past year, he released a book, The New Totalitarian Temptation, Global Governance and the Crisis of Democracy in Europe. This book has been described as one of the best books ever written about the European Union. Today's topic is timely. The purpose and future of the European Union has been in the news with the Brexit vote this past June, the recent election of Donald Trump in the United States, and voters uh, wondering uh, who they will vote for in France, Germany, and Netherlands, and maybe Italy this year. Todd holds a BA in music and German from Calvin College, and an MA in German language and literature from the University of Wisconsin. Todd will be available to greet individuals in the West Lobby of the Covenant Fine Arts Center following the presentation. Calvin College is grateful to the 2,000 members of the Calvin Academy for Lifelong Learning for underwriting today's presentation. Please welcome Todd Heisinga. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. A special thank you to Christy Potter and to everyone else uh, who was involved with the Kelvin January series. I really appreciate the work. And to the Kelvin Association for Lifelong Learning for kindly sponsoring this presentation. Um, I'd like to also uh, greet some friends of mine who are watching by webcast in Lithuania. Um, I'd like, please, uh, friends in Lithuania, have my greetings and say hello to my friend Femi Orebigi, who couldn't be here. Thank you everyone for coming. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. The only other time I was on this stage was a long time ago, I won't tell you how long ago, when I was a Calvin music major. I was performing in a recital on this stage. I was playing piano. It was a compulsory recital. There was no escape for me. <laughs> I'd chosen to play two of the six little piano pieces by Arnold Schoenberg. I picked those pieces mainly because they were extremely short, six little piano pieces, and also because they were very dissonant and atonal. If I made a mistake, I thought no one would notice. <laughs> and the first piece involved a lot of pedal on the piano, and as I was about to start, I lifted my foot to, to, to the pedal, but I was so nervous that my whole leg began to shake uncontrollably. So right then and there, I made an executive decision. Rather than fall off the piano bench, I played the whole thing without pedal. And the piece was so discordant and so different from what most people think of as music that to my great relief, no one noticed. <laughs> ah, those magic student years. But, but enough of my glory days as a Calvin music and German major. I'm here to talk about the European Union. This past summer, the British voted to leave the EU. Seven years after the outbreak of the Eurozone debt crisis, Greece remains little more than a protectorate of the International Monetary Fund, 
the European Commission, and the European Central Bank. Schengen, the system of open tra travel across borders within the EU, is in danger of being abolished. With the brutal atrocities in Paris, Brussels, Nice, Berlin, and elsewhere, the specter of jihadist terrorism haunts Europe. How did this all come about? My belief is that the European Union's commitment to supranational, Europe-wide governance, overriding the sovereign powers of the member states, is eroding democracy in Europe, fueling the Eurozone and refugee crises, and destabilizing politics in the EU member states. Beyond that, the EU's commitment to the supranationalist utopia of global governance is threatening human rights and chipping away at the foundations of our political freedom. But this isn't just a faraway continent. The radically secularist worldview that's behind the EU is affecting the US also. We need to understand Europe in order to understand what is happening here. And in order to foresee and maybe to prevent what might be to, might be to come. In this talk, I'd like to concentrate on four things. First, the EU, what it is and how it works. Second, Brexit, the British decision to leave the EU. Third, the weakening of self-government in the United States. And fourth and finally, the need to return to real sustainable freedom, freedom anchored in truth. So first, an introduction to the EU. What is the EU? That is the question. It is very hard to say what the EU is because so many different interests, values, and goals coexist within it. Also, the EU is unprecedented. Nothing like the EU has ever existed. It takes a while to plumb fully the depths of the European Union and its essence in the utopian desire to achieve peace by limiting national sovereignty and building international institutions to administer and enforce a growing body of international law. Let me give you a little summary of the basics of the EU. As I said just now, the EU is unprecedented. It is unlike any other international arrangement or organization. For example, although economic integration has been a key accomplishment of the EU, the EU is much more than say a free trade bloc like the United States, Canada, and Mexico under NAFTA. It's much more than that. Neither is it like any international organization that at first glance might seem comparable. Take the Organization of American States, the OAS. Both the EU and the OAS are regional organizations. And just as the OAS is Pan-American, encompassing the 35 states of the Western Hemisphere, the EU includes nearly all the countries in Western Europe and much of Central Europe. So the OAS and the EU are both pan-regional. But the similarities between them end there. The 28 EU member states, with their constant coordination on every possible policy issue, and their powerful common institutions in Brussels, are much more closely integrated than the member states of the OAS or any other international organization. So the EU is much more than a garden variety international organization. But neither is the EU anything like a federal state. It is not a United States of Europe. The EU member states continue to exist as independent nations. So what is the EU? When all is said and done, what it comes down to is that the EU is a supranationalist project. It functions in significant areas independently of its member states via institutions that exercise sovereign powers at a supranational level, above the national level. The EU member states, in the interest of realizing an unprecedented degree of peace, stability, and prosperity, are ceding large aspects of their sovereign governing and lawmaking powers to the supranational EU institutions that are distinct from the EU member states and that function independently above the national level. The essence of the European project, 
The hope behind the European dream is precisely this supranationalism. The project of European integration that eventually birthed the EU arose out of the ashes of World War II, the most destructive war the world has ever known. European leaders were determined that war among nation states should never again arise from European soil. This was a noble vision, and it was understandable given what had happened in Europe in World War II and before that in World War I. And despite all the problems it has caused, it remains a powerful vision today. The vision of a harmonious and peaceful Europe, united in the European Union, with Finns and Cypriots and Irish and Dutch and everyone else, all working together for a better Europe and a better world. So how does the EU actually work? As I mentioned just now, it functions primarily via powerful centralizing institutions over and above the member state governments. Let me quickly, quickly summarize two of the most important EU institutions. First, the European Commission, the EU's executive arm. The Commission implements and enforces EU regulation throughout the EU, but it also has an important legislative function. With rare exceptions, it is the only institution that has the power to propose EU legislation. This power is called the right of initiative in EU parlance. This means two things. That EU legislation starts with unelected technocrats and that the EU executive arm has perhaps the most important legislative power, thus violating the separation of powers and hindering democratic accountability. Then we have the European Parliament, the EU's parliament or Congress. But in reality, it's not a parliament. Though it approves all legislative proposals drafted by the Commission, the European Parliament does not draft legislation. The European Commission does that. It also doesn't do many other things that most national parliaments do. It doesn't have the power to levy taxes, for example. Perhaps most importantly, there is no majority party representing the government party and no minority party representing the opposition in the European Parliament because there is no government in the EU and no opposition. Rather, in the EU, everyone governs together in a hybrid, hybrid system of supranational governance. In the EU, government is nowhere and everywhere. Let me also give you a final example that I experienced as a U.S. diplomat. Although the EU treaty leaves foreign policy in the hands of the member states, with the EU solely in a secondary role, the EU has created its own de facto foreign minister with the title of High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. The EU has a weakness for long titles and it's created its own diplomatic core, its own de facto diplomatic core called the European External Action Service. These and other measures have helped make the EU itself into a foreign policy player every bit as important as the biggest EU member states. For the United States day to day, the EU is just as important in foreign policy as Germany, France, or Great Britain. This is an amazing thing. One of the world's most important foreign policy entities is a something that's not a country with a government that's not a government, a foreign minister who's not a foreign minister, and a diplomatic core that's not a diplomatic core with all of these elements making and implementing foreign policy on behalf of an organization that no one has ever been able to define in a way that everyone can agree on. So how far has this supranational governance accomplished through supranational institutions, how far has it gone in the EU? All in all, about one half to two thirds of the laws and regulations in Europe are made at EU level, not by national governments that are accountable to voters. Whole policy realms, such as trade policy, and in the Eurozone, monetary policy, 
are now handled above the national level, at EU level. This is the EU. And, and let me just say this. Despite what you might read or hear elsewhere, the EU is not about free trade, and it's not about economic integration. These things happen, they're important, but they're secondary. The EU is about supranational politics. And the EU is completely different from any other political entity in the world. But the European Union is not just about Europe. The EU sees its supranationalist approach as a model for a new way to order the world. The EU's supranationalism is all about global governance, extending the EU's form of supranational governance on a global scale in order to realize world peace by overcoming the unlimited sovereignty of nations, which the EU believes is the root of war among nations. And here the EU has real credibility. The EU, after all, is the only actually functioning model of how such global governance might work. So what is global governance? It's very hard to find a good definition of global governance. Here's how I would define global governance. Global governance is the attempt to introduce a global rule of law in the interest of achieving an unprecedented degree of global peace, stability, and prosperity, not via a one-world government. We're not talking about the UN and conspiracy theories and so forth. Not via a one-world government, but rather by the development of an ever more comprehensive network of international institutions that administer an ever greater body of international law to which nations are subject, that binds nation states not only in their foreign policy, but also in substantial areas of their domestic policy. The key to global governance is the development of a global rule of law, whereby no one knows exactly what this global rule of law will look like, no one knows how it's going to end, if an end is even meant to be achieved, much of the EU is process, process, and the global governance ideology is process, process. The core believers in the European Union are essentially utopians. They believe, or maybe it's not really a belief, maybe it's just a hope, that a kind of utopia can be achieved through supranational politics. They hope that ultimately world peace will be achievable through the new structures of governance that will arise out of the global governance project, structures perhaps modeled on the EU's structures of governance. And like every essentially utopian political project, the EU is inherently undemocratic. When you're reaching for utopia, mere voters cannot be allowed to stand in the way. And because the supranational unification of Europe happened largely without the full understanding and consent of the European peoples, the voters, it has come to be cloaked over the decades in overlapping layers of obscurity, complexity, and insider jargon, thus avoiding scrutiny and forestalling the development of any effective opposition. Here's a telling testimony to that. In a fit of reckless transparency, Jean-Claude Juncker, then Prime Minister of Luxembourg and now President of the European Commission, once described the EU modus operandi as follows. He said, we decide something and then we just throw it out there and wait a while to see what happens. If there are no big howls of protest and no uprisings, because most people don't even understand what was decided, we just go on, step by step, until there is no turning back." End quote. Over the years, this method has met with smashing success. As a result, most people don't know what the European Union is. In fact, most Europeans don't know. Most educated, intelligent, politically astute Europeans really do not know what the European Union is. But people, regular people, are, begin, are beginning to figure it out instinctively, if not always in a way that they can articulate. And that brings us to the second topic I'd like to cover, 
Brexit, the British decision to leave the EU. Brexit was immeasurably important, not only for Britain, but also for the rest of the world, including the United States. I can sum up the significance of Brexit in one hyphenated word, self-government. If you remember one thing about Brexit today, I hope you remember that Brexit struck a blow for self-government. What happened? What was it? On June 23, 2016, British voters were asked a straightforward question. I quote, should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union? In response, they could check one of two options, remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union. 52% of British voters checked leave and 48% checked remain. The voter turnout of 72% was higher than in any election since 1992. Most observers were dumbstruck. The British had actually decided to leave the European Union. And that despite the conventional wisdom coming from almost all of the experts and authorities that Brexit would lead to painful economic decline. It was a tremendously courageous decision. I think that we need to recognize that. The dire pred predictions of economic decline were myriad. George Osborne, Britain's Czech Chancellor of the Ex Exchequer at the time, the equivalent of our Secretary of the Treasury, said that not a single serious economist does not think Brexit will be bad for the economy. The British Treasury warned that the average British household would be around the equivalent of $6,000 a year worse off if the UK left the EU. The Treasury pro projected that by the year 2030, gross domestic product would be 6.2% less than it would have been. 6.2%. As the columnist George Will said about the 6.2% projection, this confirms that, economics, that economists prove their sense of humor by using decimal points. <laughs> Outside of Britain, World Bank President Jim Yong Kim warned of Brexit's negative economic impact globally. The International Monetary Fund predicted that Brexit would increase inflation and decrease GDP by around 5.5%, another decimal point. So what has actually happened so far since the Brexit vote? It's now been about six months. In late September, the British Office for National Statistics said the Brexit vote had had no major effect on the economy. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development noted that financial markets had stabilized since the Brexit vote. Right now, retail sales are up, online sales are up. The Bank of England has raised its forecast for economic growth uh, for 2017 from 1.4% to 1.4% from 0.8%. Decimal points and more decimal points. Um, so, so far, the feared economic decline has not, not occurred, but that doesn't mean that Brexiteers should be gloating about it because we still don't know what will happen medium term or long term. Depending on how you look at it, there are signs that real turbulence could come. The British pound lost almost a fifth of its value against the dollar after the referendum, and then it recovered slightly in December. The new British prime minister said something about a hard Brexit happening a few days ago, and the British pound plummeted again. So we don't know what's going to happen. So far, what the economic fallout from Brexit has done is it's provided yet another proof that no one knows the future. Again, Brexit was about self-government. And given the EU's predations on national sovereignty, its presumption that EU law trumps domestic legislation, its presumption that decisions of the, European, the EU High Court, the European Court of Justice, take precedence over Britain's Supreme Court in cases of conflict, I think you can see why most Britons, whose country has legitimate claim to being the oldest continually functioning democracy in the world, wanted to take their democracy back. One more point about Brexit. You remember I said earlier 
that most Europeans do not know what the European Union is, that even most astute, educated, intelligent Europeans don't know what the European Union is. That is also a big reason for Brexit. Brexit happened as the end result of the fact that the British never really understood the European Union. The British thought they were signing up for a free trade agreement and a single market. When enough of them finally realized that they'd gotten themselves into much more than that, they voted for Brexit. So the EU's commitment to supranational, ultimately global governance has eroded democracy in Europe. That was my first point. With Brexit, British voters chose to take back their self-government. That was my second point. But self-government is in danger not only in Europe. It also faces great and growing obstacles in the United States. And that brings me to my third topic, the American administrative state. Similarly to how the EU is ruled to a large extent by unelected Eurocrats who are basically unaccountable to Euro European citizens, the US is ruled increasingly by bureaucrats, judges, people with advanced degrees in public administration or urban planning or public health, and other experts. Now first when I say bureaucrat, I want to make it very clear that I'm using that purely as a descriptive term, not as a pejorative term. I am proud to have served my country as the diplomatic version of a bureaucrat, an unelected foreign policy expert for 20 years. Let me just say it loud and proud, it is an honorable calling to serve one's country as a bureaucrat. And besides, some of my best friends are bureaucrats. <laughs> but under the administrative state, things have gotten out of hand. The bureaucracy has expanded to the point at which many civil servants are making the laws, regulations, and policy that our elected political representatives, who are accountable to us, should be making. The administrative state has grown so explosively in recent times that by 2013, administrators were making an estimated 30 times more regulations under which Americans live than Congress made laws. But the number of regulations is not the main problem. The problem is the unaccountable power of the agencies that make the regulations. To say it another way, I am not talking here about small government. I am talking about democratically accountable government. One point of confusion, I think, is that regulations are actually laws, and Congress should be making the laws. Instead, as one observer puts it, I quote, Congress passes laws that delegate its legislative power to governmental agencies, and these agencies, staffed by unelected civil servants, in turn develop the laws with which we must comply, end quote. What is even worse is that many government agencies exercise all three powers of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. Here's how one analyst describes a typical agency of the administrative state, the Federal Trade Commission. I quote, the commission makes rules. It then authorizes investigations into possible violations of those rules. The commission then conducts the investigation and reports its findings to the commission. The commission's complaint that a commission rule has been violated is then prosecuted by the commission and adjudicated by the commission. In certain cases, if the final decision is adverse to the commission, the commission can then appeal to the commission." End quote. Founding father James Madison was right when he wrote that combining all three government powers in the same hands is the very definition of tyranny. The administrative state, rule by bureaucracy, is nourishing a growing perception in this country that America is changing into something unrecognizable, a country run by an unaccountable professional elite, and a country that is substantially less free, just as Europe under the EU is less free. And here's where my fourth theme comes in. Talked about the EU, talked about Brexit, talked about the administrative state. Um, my fourth theme is hopefully a theme that will tie this whole presentation together because it all comes down to freedom. 
Freedom is the principal political accomplishment of the West and the primary basis of our political well-being. But freedom is possible only if it is anchored in truth. And this is my fourth theme. Freedom to be sustainable must be anchored in truth. In the U.S., our self-government is based on the recognition that certain things are unchangeably true. And thus, that government must respect these truths in order to be just. To quote the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. A more profound elucidation of how freedom is anchored in these self-evident truths can be found in the Federalist Papers. This brilliant series of 85 essays defending the U.S. Constitution, the Federalist Papers, was published in 1787 in a series and 1788 during the debate on whether to ratify the U.S. Constitution. And it is striking if you read the Federalist Papers, and I recommend that you read them after you read my book, it is striking how deeply indebted the Federalist Papers is to the bedrock assumption of an unchanging truth about human nature. That human beings, while capable of great good, are also flawed and subject to the temptation to abuse power. Christians, and maybe especially Calvinists, would put it another way, that human beings, while possessing immeasurable dignity as creatures made in the image of God, are also sinful. The entire U.S. system of government is based on this very sober view of the limits of human nature, and thus of the limits of government. This is why we have the separation of powers and the checks and balances foreseen in the, U in the U.S. Constitution. Because human beings will always tend to abuse power, the powers of government had to be limited and divided into multiple branches so that the flawed human beings who hold governmental power could not impose a tyranny on everyone else. And I believe that these views on truth and human nature that inform the Federalist Papers and the U.S. Constitution are still the prevailing instinctive views of most Americans today. At the same time, though, respect for objective truth has lost ground in America to an unwitting relativism. Without realizing it, Many Americans have succumbed to a trickle-down form of postmodernism, in which objective truth is no longer authoritative. Instead, truth is in the eyes of the beholder. A standard definition describes postmodernism as, I quote, characterized by broad subjectivism or relativism, a suspicion of reason, and an acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power, end quote. This type of subversive relativism, the suspicion that truth is not really truth, but simply the tool of the politically and economically powerful, has seeped into virtually all areas of life. It is the heart of identity politics, for example, and the heart of political correctness, Identity politics and political correctness are the two sides of the same postmodern coin. Political correctness, in my view, is nothing more and nothing less than the behavioral and linguistic code by which the elites in the media and the universities and so forth force the populace to obey the dogmas of identity politics. They both reject, both political correctness and identity politics, reject the idea that there is any truth claim that can command greater allegiance than the feelings or opinions of any individual or group, especially if that group is deemed to be disadvantaged. Reality itself is nothing more than what e each individual or group feels it to be. Individual choice and group identity reign and reality can and must be reshaped in the service of individual choice and group identity. Ultimately, the only thing that is objectively true is my subjective assessment of what is true for me. 
This idea at the core of the postmodern worldview, the idea that freedom means the right to disregard truth and decide for myself what is true, is the complete inversion of the traditional idea that freedom must be anchored in real, objective, and lasting truth. And arising out of this inversion of freedom, freedom anchored in truth, is an inversion of justice. The justice of identity politics is that society at large not only recognize, but also support in language, thought, and legislation each group's self-definition of its tribal truth. We see this now especially in the LGBT rights and gender identity movement, and in the resulting challenges coming from all corners to the religious liberty of Orthodox Christians. And we see it also in the administrative state, in which bureaucrats and experts, the ones who know better, assert their right to make, apply, and enforce the laws that keep the politically incorrect masses within the boundaries of the politically correct. Similar, similarly to all of this, the EU's project of supranational governance has been fueled by postmodernism at an international level, a kind of global political correctness in the sphere of international politics, the spirit of postmodernism has seized the opportunity presented by the end of the Cold War for new ways of thinking about world order. In the last 25 years, political postmodernism has made great progress toward bringing about a Nietzschean transvaluation of all political values. It has deconstructed and redefined political categories associated with modernity, such as, for example, the nation state, national sovereignty, international law, and human rights in order to assert a new post-national view of governance and a new kind of human rights corresponding on an international level to identity politics on a national level. These new human rights are based like identity politics on a denial of truth. No longer does human rights mean the right to live, speak, and act in accordance with the unchanging truth about human nature, in accordance with that which promotes human flourishing. Rather, human rights now stands for the right to choose above all else, the right to choose one, one's own personal truth and thus to be liberated from the truth claims of others while imposing one's own truth claim about oneself on everyone else just like identity politics. But since the new human rights and the rejection of the traditional idea that freedom must be anchored in real, objective, and lasting truth are both based implicitly on a denial of enduring truth itself, everything traditional, everything true, is now up for grabs, including the question of what human rights are. This uncertainty, this question of what human rights are, demands resolution. And thus, it becomes inevitable that human rights themselves will be redetermined, and that by none other than those who hold political power. After all, in a world without the authority of objective truth, only those who hold political power have authority that is enforceable. In principle, no relativist is far from Mao Zedong's famous dictum, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Not surprisingly, the new human rights downplays the classical rights that protect the individual from government, such as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and favors rights that must be enforced by government, such as women's rights, defined as the right to choose, especially the right to choose an abortion, children's rights, asserted and protected by the state, often against parents, and LGBT rights, the right to choose one's own sexual and gender identity. Thus, with this political redefinition of human rights, the individual's so-called unlimited right to choose becomes the unlimited right of the government 
to decide what may or may not be chosen. So government, as guarantor of universal human rights, expands inexorably to government as master. And with the global reach of communications, travel, commerce, and ideas, government as master expands geographically also. Just as government power to determine what human rights are is in principle unlimited, so it also becomes impossible to limit the power of government to a certain geographical area or to a certain people. Global supranational governance thus becomes the only rational option. And national sovereignty becomes, in principle, an impermissible limit on the elite's power to decide for everyone what is just and true. The postmodern political project of supranational governance thus unmasks itself not as a benign desire to improve humanity's lot, but instead as an unlimited power grab to define truth and justice under the banner of universal human rights. And the U.S., as I've tried to show, is far from immune from this. While our freedom in language, thought, and legislation is being undermined on the one end by postmodern political correctness, on the other end, our national sovereignty is under assault by a fashionable globalism, a particularly American version of the global governance ideology. Supreme Court justices cite foreign court rulings as support for their judgments on American constitutional questions. Left-wing NGOs push unofficial, tendentious interpretations of UN conventions and customary international law to assert rights heretofore non-existent in the US jurisprudence, and implicitly to deny Americans' constitutional rights if they conflict with these new human rights. So you see it in the EU, and you see it in the US. The breakdown of the West's traditional reverence for truth, objective truth, has everything to do with the waning of self-government. Everywhere around us, in both America and Europe, a poorly understood, trickle-down postmodernism is already eroding our freedom and affecting our well-being. Whether we want to be or not, we who believe in self-government if we really believe in self-government, are engaged in a battle that goes much deeper than mere political differences. Why? The Judeo-Christian view of an unchanging human nature embedded in tradition, religion, community, and family, the worldview that grounds self-government in the West, no longer commands the general allegiance of our Western society. And the partisans of postmodern political correctness are committed to a radically secularist vision of the virtually unlimited malleability of human nature according to each person's choice, essentially independent of traditional institutions and social relations. Once freedom of choice has been exalted above all else, there can be no limits, neither geographical nor aspirational to the powers government should wield in the non-negotiable pursuit of universal human rights. Surely, Brexit struck a powerful, glow, a powerful blow for self-government. And hopefully the British example will help inspire Americans to reinvigorate self-government too by putting ourselves through our political representatives back in charge. But without an understanding of and respect for truth, it won't last. A humble respect for truth, along with a recognition of the limits of politics, remains the only basis for realizing self-government in justice and freedom. So if we believe in truth, let's humbly but courageously engage in the battle of worldviews that faces us in the postmodern political square. For Christians, that doesn't mean forcing our religious beliefs on others. Nor does it mean 
claiming that there's a certain set of Christian political opinions, nor that there is a uniquely Christian party affiliation. Nor does it mean, and this needs to be said in the current political context in the U.S., nor does it mean engaging in claims that political opponents are liars and have inaugurated a so-called post-truth era. But what it does mean is it means unashamedly engaging in the public square from a Christian perspective. It means fighting for the knowability of truth and fighting for reason as a basis for respect, communication, and persuasion across differences. And it means doing so in a way that seeks the good not only for ourselves, but also for our opponents. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Rick Truer from the Advancement Division here at Calvin College, and if you have a question that you've written out on a card and you would like to have that collected and brought up to the stage, feel free to hold that up and an usher will collect it and bring it down. Um, since you mentioned Lithuania at the beginning of the speech, I'm going to start with a question that came in from Lithuania. Excellent. So, is, uh, EU weakening of individual sovereignty better than the U.S. praise of individual opinion? Than the U.S. what? Praise of individual opinion. Um, well, I'm not sure that I see exactly where the conflict is there. Um, what, what I'm talking about is the fact, and it may be an unfortunate fact, maybe we would wish that it could be better, but the fact that freedom and democracy and freedom of opinion and freedom of thought is really only guaranteed so far um, in a system based on nation states, in a system based on national sovereignty, where a people comes together and decides, we want to recognize that this is a nation, that we are a nation, and that um, we want to have a government that's structured in this way, and we agree to live under that government, and that government is instituted by us, the people who ultimately have sovereignty. We lend the sovereignty to the government. Um, that government guarantees the rights that we have unalienably as human beings. So far, that has only been uh, logically, let's say, possible, long-term possible, in a system of nation states. Because above the nation state level, there's not enough understanding of what's going on by people. There's too much distance. And there's not enough unity to form a comprehensive polity. And thus there's very little democratic accountability. So that's what I think that question was getting at. Thank you, Lithuania. <laughs> uh, we have a question from a student um, wondering, do you see a direct correlation between the Brexit vote and the 2016 presidential election here? Yeah, yeah that, that is a question that um, is uh, on most people's mind, I think, when we talk about Brexit or when we talk about Donald Trump, and for several good reasons. Um, one, that Donald Trump, I don't know if you remember, just happened to be in uh, the United Kingdom on the day of the Brexit vote and gave a... Uh, a press conference praising the Brexit decision. Also because uh, Donald Trump has recommended to the British government that Nigel Farage, who is one of the, or the leader of the Brexit movement in, in Britain, be appointed ambassador of Britain to the United States. Um, so Brexit has become, um, to be, come to be kind of connected in a certain sense with Donald Trump. I would say, I'm really glad the question was formulated as it was. Is there a direct connection? I would say no, but I would say there is definitely an indirect connection. I would say that um, this election in the United States was much more about making government accountable to the real people than many elections have been in the past in the United States. This election occurred in a context of 
voter alienation from government and voter alienation from elites. Um, and the idea that we are sovereign, we the people, and we want our elected leaders to listen to us, and we want them to recognize that we ultimately are in charge. And I think the best evidence for that is not Donald Trump alone. The best evidence for that is Bernie Sanders on the left and Donald Trump on the right. There were many, many similarities between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, and I think that no matter which side of the political spectrum you stand on, that if you believe in self-government, um, I think that you really have to uh, consider the argument that the Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump phenomenon of reacting to real Americans' concerns about the direction of their country and real Americans' concerns about the distance of their government from the citizens, that, that Trump and Sanders got it exactly right. I think you really have to consider that. So Brexit was about self-government in a different context than in the United States, about taking it back from supranational governance. And this election was about, within the American polity, making our government more responsive again. All right, thanks. I've had a couple questions regarding, wondering if you can comment on the roles and relationships between organizations like the UN and the EU, and the EU and NATO. Yes, uh, excellent question, thank you. Um, so, connection between the UN and the EU and the EU and NATO. Well, the similarity between all of those organizations is that they're international organizations. But as I, as I mentioned in my speech, the EU is different from any other international organization. I'll take NATO first. Of course, NATO is a military alliance and the EU is a political economic uh, organization. But the, the, the main difference for the purposes of this discussion is that the NATO is an, org, is an international organization in the traditional sense. It is an organization of sovereign member states. There is nothing in NATO membership that indicates that a, that a, a government of a country should be forced to en do anything that contradicts its national sovereignty. Countries agree that it is in their sovereign interest to come together and ally militarily and they agree to do certain things that do not violate their constitutions or their basic laws, and there you have NATO, a traditional international organization. The EU is something completely different. The EU is all about giving up sovereignty. The EU very often puts it this way, pooling sovereignty, about the members pooling sovereignty in kind of a central repository, the institutions in Brussels, in order to build a better world in which national sovereignty cannot do the evil things that many people in the EU believe uh, it has been responsible for. UN, the main technical difference between the UN and the EU is that the UN is a global organization and the EU is a, uh, is a regional organization. Now, I can tell you that uh, the UN is a venerated organization in Europe because the UN stands for the European elite's belief that at some point it's going to be possible to develop a, a system of global governance and bring us all together peacefully. Um, and that's kind of the heart of a big problem with the e UN in my view. The UN as it is can be a very good thing. The UN as it is is a global organization of sovereign member states that does not call into the question of member states. Uh, a forum so that they can get together, debate issues of common uh, interest, and try to decide on conflicts in an amicable way. Um, that is a good thing. However, the UN bureaucracy uh, and the UN true believers, if I might use that term, want more for the UN. They want the UN to kind of be the, 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 the birthing organization of what the EU is regionally. And that's why we have problems that we have with the UN. That's why we have a lot of people in the United States who correctly, in my view, are very, very suspicious of the UN. Because it, there are many people in the UN who desire to use it in order to undermine Americans or anyone else's right to, um, 
to organize their political system as they so desire. All right, thank you. I've had um, several questions to um, speaking to immigration fears with Brexit and concerns about that. And then also another question from a student wondering, how is the EU shaping or being shaped by European nations' response to the refugee crisis? Yes, uh, all good questions. Um, this is another common thread, which I'm not ready to make so, uh, kind of a blanket statement about why it's a common thread. But this is a common thread. Um, you know, uh, concerns about immigration, concerns about borders. Excuse me a minute. But here's what I have to say, one of the things I have to say about Brexit and immigration. And that is that what you read in the newspapers or read in the newspapers or online about Brexit and about the issue being um, that the, the Brits did not want to have unlimited freedom of movement for EU citizens of other EU countries to come to Great Britain and work. That was one thing you always heard. Or that the British didn't want EU regulations to compromise the prosperity and success of the city of London, the EU's Wall Street, or other issues. That was all right. These were issues in Brexit, but they were not the main issues. Um, it's a very common kind of modus operandi, if I may say, of the, those who, who, who push the conventional wisdom about the EU and about supranationalism, that no, 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 it's not about supranationalism, it's about these other issues. Or, no, 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 it's not about the Brits being worried about self-government, it's that they're xenophobic and they don't like immigrants. Um, I consider that to be completely bogus. Um, yes, the British wanted to control immigration via their sovereign government doing whatever they might want to do with immigration, representing them. Um, the, the British wanted to, pre to preserve Great Britain. Um, these things are legitimate parts of policy. They're legitimate things for government to do, and they're absolutely uh, normal and good things to debate and then decide on in any democratic polity. Immigration is not an issue that should be left outside the realm of political debate because everybody who wants to limit immigration is a xenophobe. It's not true. There's an example for you of political correctness. No, 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 no. You can't, be, you can't talk about immigration because you're, then you're xenophobic. Um, I know a lot of people who are for limiting immigration to the United States. Um, I have waffled from one end to the other actually on that issue myself. And I can tell you, um, you know, they're not xenophobes because they are concerned about the U.S. controlling its borders. All right, thanks. We are almost out of time here, but I did have a couple questions from students who are wondering um, how you might get involved with um, foreign service. And also, what role did uh, being a music major play <laughs> in your decision? Vocationally. Um, the only role my being a music major played was after the thing with my foot, my leg shaking uncontrollably, and man, it really did. Um, I decided I will never go on this stage again unless I'm talking about the EU. <laughs> so that was the role my music major played. Um, no, actually, I want to say that... Uh, being uh, interested in all kinds of different things is very important in the Foreign Service. Um, the Foreign Service, um, it, it, ver it helps very much in the Foreign Service to know a little bit about everything and not too much about anything, as they often say, because you're talking with all kinds of different people, different backgrounds, different interests, and so knowing something about music, literature, physics, um, chemistry, whatever, is always helpful in kind of building relationships with people who are from a different country than you are. Foreign service, I'm really glad that that question was asked, how do you, you know, go about this? It's very, very straightforward, um, very easy to do. Every year they have a series of tests to get into the foreign service. Um, the first test is a kind of a day-long written exam. 
um, and you simply go on the state.gov website and sign up for that test. And I took the test at Calvin College. I believe it's still given every year at Calvin College. Um, and if you, if you pass that test, then you go to another um, day of oral examinations, which are mainly role plays, pretending you're in the Foreign Service, etc. And if you pass that, you undergo a physical examination for health, a health clearance, and then a security examination for security clearance. And if you pass all of that, then you get put on a waiting list. Um, and then when your name comes up, um, you, you're, you then start in the Foreign Service. So it's a long process, but it's a very straightforward process. And you really don't even have to worry that much about being interviewed, you know, um, about whether you've missed a part in shaving or whatever, you know, when an interview that you look right. You don't even have to worry about that. It's basically kind of these tests. So it's a very uh, straightforward process. And I encourage anyone who's interested to just give it a try and take the first test. All right. Thank you. And thank you for that plug for liberal arts education, too. We appreciate that. So. Yes. Uh, he will be available in the lobby after the talk. Thank you very much.